I'm Kendall Miller. For the past several years, I've been conducting intensive interviews and research into the making of Lost Horizon, Frank Capra's enduring masterpiece. It is my pleasure to present for this exclusive DVD presentation some fascinating highlights from the production of this classic motion picture. Production began on March 23, 1936, with the filming of the framing or flashback device, which Capra cut before the original release. As originally edited, the film opens in the London office of the Foreign Secretary, dissolved to an evening shot of the steamer's exterior, and then an interior of her radio room, where Gainsford, played by Hugh Butler, dictates another cablegram. Conway has suffered a complete loss of memory, and any public demonstration should be canceled to avoid undue excitement. Another dissolve finds Gainsford in the ship's bar, telling his assembled colleagues that all he knows of Conway's previous whereabouts is that he wandered into a Chinese mission with no idea where he came from or how he got there, and that he is to join them shortly. Rare production stills, assembled here for the first time, pick up the story. As Conway enters the bar, he is besieged by autograph seekers. Gainsford comes to the rescue, steering him to a table of friends. Comfortably anonymous, Conway comments on the group's glum faces, asking, did you say these were friends of mine or my pallbearers? The sound of a piano from an adjoining salon stirs Conway and his face sobers. They enter the salon to hear the recital by Sieb King, played by Max Rabinowitz. Sieb King plays a Chopin waltz and Chopin's butterfly etude as Conway's expression becomes profoundly thoughtful. Conway crosses to the piano and begins to play impromptu in B minor. The haunting music draws Sieb King back to the piano. He asks Conway to identify the piece. Searching his memory, Conway suddenly recalls it is an unpublished Chopin study he'd learned from one of Chopin's pupils. Startled, Sieb King argues, why that's impossible. If a pupil of Chopin were alive today, he'd have to be over 120 years old. Conway snaps back, what of it? What is it, Conway? Concerned Gainford asks, as he continues to play the mental cobwebs clear. Suddenly, Conway jumps to his feet, declaring he must leave the ship. Must go back, he says, as the others follow him onto the deck. Conway murmurs, Shangri-La, Shangri-La. He stares blankly before beginning. You'll probably think I've gone mad when you've heard the story. Conway tells of the evacuation from Best School by describing the turmoil. The confusion was terrific, he says, and the scene dissolves to the opening of Lost Horizon as we know it today. In preview, the framing device was resumed near the picture's end. Conway stumbles into a Tibetan village and collapses, and the scene dissolves back to the deck of the SS Manchuria as he concludes his tale to a disbelieving audience. Ignoring fears for his condition, Conway goes below to pack for the long journey back to Shangri-La. Gainsford attempts to block his efforts to leave by locking him in his cabin. Conway protests as he hears the lock snap. Grabbing a suitcase, he escapes through the window, shoves past petty officers, and descends the gangplank. Gainsford pleads for his return as Conway disappears into the distance and the scene fades. A year passes, Gainsford recounts Conway's astonishing adventures, the penultimate moment of the film as it exists today. It was just ended a chase that lasted nearly 10 months. In preview, the basketball sequence began near the start of reel two, so eliminating both ends of the flashback save about 10 minutes of running time. Now let's move to scenes that stayed in the film. The shots in the basketball waiting room and the exterior evacuation scenes were all completed at the Metropolitan Airport, now Southern California's Van Nuys Airport, for four evenings in early April 1936. As desperate Chinese press upon them, Conway and his brother George escort the women and children to the Fokker airplane sent to evacuate the refugees. Soundman Edward Burns recalled, Capra liked close, confused shots because a closer shot filled with action gives you a better feel of turmoil than a longer shot. Capra was a master in his handling of crowd scenes, but the presence of 500 Chinese-speaking extras slowed the proceedings considerably. The interior scenes were set up and shot quickly, with Capra maintaining the brisk tempo that had become his trademark. The burning of the hangar scene, not in James Hilton's novel, was created by Capra and screenwriter Robert Riskin to immediately establish Conway's masterful handling of a crisis. The actual burning of the bamboo hangar was a tour de force of planning and execution. A brief rehearsal was conducted. Assistant Director Buddy Coleman barked out Capra's staging orders over a public address system and the translator quickly interpreted. With five policemen on hand to keep order and handle spectators, two first aid men and a nurse present in case of injury, the electrical crew stood ready with fire hoses and a firebrand. All right, Buddy, Capra said quietly, throw it. The hangar burst into flames, shooting 200 feet into the air. First assistant cameraman Al Keller captured the proceedings in these rare, on-location photographs of Capra, cinematographer Joseph Walker, and his camera crew. 
Al Keller had begun his association with Walker and Capra on the 1930 picture, Rain or Shine. Starting as a film loader, he slowly worked his way up to the demanding job of first assistant. With his Leica camera, he photographed the activities of the cast and crew. These images are being presented here for the first time by kind permission of his family. For Conway and Party's escape plane, Columbia leased a Douglas DC-2 from American Airlines. It was used for exteriors only in the Bascule evacuation and the refueling sequence, and the in-flight shots as it climbs ever higher against the backdrop of the Sierra Nevada mountains standing in for the Himalayas. The crew traveled to Victorville, about 150 miles from the studio in the high desert near Mojave. The following morning before dawn, a bus took them to their final destination, Lucerne Dry Lake and three days of shooting in the desert sun's blistering heat. The location scouts had chosen this hellish spot because it best simulated the look of the Tibetan plateau. Here we see aerial cinematographer Elmer Dyer arriving in a biplane piloted by Frank Clark. Dyer was responsible for shots of the DC-2 in flight and the process shots of passing clouds and mountains. These are seen through the windows of the process body. In this case, simply a mock-up of the plane's interior with removable or wild sides for lighting and camera access. All the interior shots of the plane were filmed in this mock-up seen here at Lucerne Dry Lake with its right side removed. Walker's crew used three cameras to shoot the landing. These Al Keller photos show what they captured on film. Bandits approach the plane as it rolls to a stop. The Mongols circle the plane on horseback, accelerating the scene's tempo. Working quickly, the crew sets up cameras behind the plane to catch the bandits as they threaten Conway back into the doorway. From the platform, Keller snapped a succession of still photos. For the refueling sequence, soundman Ed Burns offered a suggestion Capra would fully exploit. Have a Mongol use a bayonet to hack open the five gallon gas cans to add pace and savagery to the scene. Here's property master Jack Wren walking towards us. Capra trained three cameras on the animals camel breeder Frank Rigoyen had brought to location. Later, they'd be roused by the dust and wind kicked up by the DC-2's departure. This was cut to just seconds in the final film. Tibetan expert Harrison Foreman wasn't satisfied with the rented bandit clothing from Western Costume Company. With Capra's approval, he slit the sleeves and pant legs with a pocket knife and for good measure, had some extra shave their heads. This fellow named Kong sounds his alarm, which is one of the final shots at the desert location. Joseph Walker waves farewell. Shortly, the crew would be exchanging intense heat for bitter cold. Capra was always disappointed with the South Pole sequences in his 1931 film, Dirigible. They had been filmed on the site of the old Army Balloon School in Arcadia, California. Tons of gypsum and marble dust simulated falling snow, and bleached cornflakes were used for blizzards. But Capra was troubled that no breath showed in supposedly Arctic temperatures. Enter Mr. Nels H. Rosberg, production manager of California Consumers Corporation. Rosberg conceived of using one of his company's cold storage warehouses as a refrigerated soundstage. He's shown here in the demonstration reel he produced to promote studio interest. Capra attended a screening and knew instantly he could have the frosty breath, real snow, and controlled lighting conditions he wanted for Lost Horizon. 23 of the film's 100 days of principal photography were spent in the Los Angeles Ice and Cold Storage facility located at 620 Mesquite Street near 7th in downtown Los Angeles. Regis Goopser, chief production engineer for California Consumer Corporation, was an electrical engineer and, like Capra, a graduate of Caltech. We owe the remarkable photographs you'll see here to his foresight and his family's kind permission. The first scenes in which frosty breath is evident occur after the plane refuels, departs, and climbs into uncharted Himalayan territory. The process body plane was reassembled on the 24-degree stage for the interior in-flight scenes. At this point, the stage was free of ice and snow, here we see the cast in the mock-up between takes. Now Isabel Jewell gives her nothing to lose speech. Jewell again as the plane starts to go down. Coleman after the crash. The rest of the party after the crash. And the cast exiting the fuselage. For shots of the crash plane and the trek to Shangri-La, Columbia's art department constructed and painted these frameworks of canvas and plaster casters allowed them to be repositioned to suggest a long ascent. Mounted on a high platform, two large bins equipped with trap doors could create an avalanche of snow and bleached cornflakes. Each take required four hours for refilling. In rough cut, a now lost additional avalanche passed over the party as they approached Shangri-La. 
Nils Rosberg had invented a snow machine that could deliver 11 tons of snow per hour. 300 pound blocks of ice were cut, crushed, and delivered to a blower that pulverized and aerated the ice to produce snow. Here we see the crash plane in a view of the lighting located just above the camera line. On the ceiling, nearly four miles of ammonia piping cooled the stage. After the completion of the mock-up interiors, the construction crew arrived with the plywood components of an exterior DC-2 mock-up to be assembled on the 13,000 square foot floor. Once assembled, the smaller scale mock-up proved quite convincing. The rival Chang and the rescue party took two days to film due to the noisy overhead snow shaker. Still photographer Irving Lippmann snapped these photos between takes. Now we see crew members snowing in two of the movable frameworks for a trekking scene. The trip back to civilization at Picture's End was the final sequence shot in the ice house. This shot was part of the descent as Maria joins Conway in the attempt to make their way back. At the recently purchased Columbia Ranch in Burbank, Capra shot Conway collapsing in close-up at the foot of a curtain or mausoleum. For the ascent to Shangri-La, Capra and company used a combination of painted backdrops and process shots. Here we see a process screen set up for rear projection. In some instances, mirrors were employed to bend the projected images into position for photography. Despite many technical challenges, Capra pictured here with Chief Electrician George Hager pressed on. For all the realism the Ice House provided, there was simply no way that Capra could suggest a thousand mile journey over many months. Capra turned to documentary filmmaker Andrew Martin for authentic high altitude snow footage, dawning sun images, and long shots of individuals trudging through the snow. Additional footage was called from Arnold Fonk's 1930 film, Storm Over Mont Blanc. In early June of 1936, three days shooting captured the film's next pivotal moment, the entrance into Shangri-La. For this scene, Capra would be the first director to film on a brand new pair of unique sound stages. The wall separating stages eight and nine could be opened to create one colossal 300 by 75 foot facility. Here we see Joseph Walker with that wall in view under the ladder. Capra observes as lighting requirements are established using stand-ins. That's assistant director Buddy Coleman to the left with the stand-ins, and a close-up of the stand-ins with Alta Mae Smith, Isabel Jules' double seated in front. Here, bit players wait between setups, and Capra stands on the brand new camera crane being used for the first time. That's first assistant Al Keller, seated at the end following focus with a process screen depicting the howling winds beyond. The camera crane prepares to pull back and the cast begins their entrance. Welcome to Shangri-La. This rocky defile became the setting for two of Lost Horizon's best love moments. Conway's stunned expression of soulful wonderment as he confronts a breathtaking mystery beyond words and his farewell close-up as we feel the heartbreak of abandoning Shangri-La Sandra, and he shared dream of a better world. This painting of the mountains, Thomasary, and Vernon Valley below was a rear projected still image on glass called a stereo by technicians. The photography for the special effect was by Ganal Kit Carson. From this detailed miniature set, only the Lamasary would be used as part of a single process night shot. The Lamasary miniature was too close to the floor of the valley for the background setting to be used. Small flickering lights were placed on a slow-moving model train to indicate the torch-bearing mourners. The Lamasary model and train were photographed in register with a glass shot painting, placing them high above the valley floor. Supervising art director Stephen Gusson assigned the task of art direction to Paul Murphy and Lionel Banks, pictured here with him. Gusson is holding Carrie O'Dell's watercolor conceptions of their work. O'Dell recalled that Banks and Murphy would rough out their ideas and work with draftsmen in the art department until they settled upon the designs which O'Dell used as the basis for his sketches. These were presented to Capra and Columbia President Harry Cohn for final approval. Designing Lost Horizon's mini sets took over a year. Here, Gusan and Capra considered an early design for the Lamasary. Except for the reflection pool and the stairway approach, this humble, realistic look was abandoned for an idealized structure of dramatic proportions. Nearly 500 feet wide, 1,000 feet long, with a central facade, 90 feet high. For filming, freshly cut blossoms and leaves would be added to the trees we see in this photo. Here are a few vantage points of the Lamasary that we never see in the finished film. The left front portion of the central facade shows the tree now fully dressed. 
Looking even further to the left, this time from the foot of the first stairway, note the artificial mountains designed to cover the telephone poles lining the ranch property. Standing on the first landing, looking to the extreme right, we see the grand curve of the wall that continues around until it meets the imposing central facade facing the reflection pool. Al Keller perched himself on the roof just above the window in this picture to take the following photo. These Mendela designs, Tibetan symbols of the universe, are barely evident in the film. The lamasery itself was white. The stairways and the two landings were pink to offset them in black and white photography. To take full advantage of natural light, Joseph Walker specified the correct orientation prior to construction, which took a month and a half. Al Keller took this aerial photo of the lamasery set, which was a hollow shell at the Columbia Ranch, near the corner of Verdugo and Hollywood Way in Burbank, California. The mini mall, called the Burbank Town Center, now occupies this site. And now I'd like to turn to a reconstruction of the approach to the lamasery and some scenes that were cut before the film was previewed in the fall of 1936. Relatively few complete scenes were cut from Lost Horizon, but many were trimmed, some drastically. Entrances and exits were first to go. Three days in May were spent setting up the many camera angles for the rescue party's walk and entrance to the lamasery. Irving Littman snapped this photo at the far end of the reflection pool. This glass shot painting of the Caracal Mountains and register with the Lamasery was the work of E. Roy Davidson. They begin their approach without benefit of the glass shot. Capra lines up a shot of the arrival. The cast gets ready for the setup. The camera rolls as Chang, played by H.B. Warner, passes in review. Capra and Coleman confer as they rehearse another angle of the approach. After some initial concern over Capra's working methods, Ronald Coleman would slowly come to appreciate the director's spirit of experimentation, and together they would devise dialogue and atmospheric touches, enhancing the overall picture. Here, Conway nears the staircase, glimpsing a young lady atop an upper pavilion. It's Sandra, played by lovely Jane Wyatt, on her first day of shooting. Here, she is joined by head grip Jimmy Lloyd, checking the light from offstage reflectors prior to filming. This Irving Lippmann photo is the best image we have of the Kappa crew at work. In filming Lost Horizon, two cameras were used on nearly every setup. For the burning of the bascal hangar and the refueling sequence, four and five cameras were trained on the action. In the center of this shot, longtime crew member Buster Livett holding a fish pole mic is recording the native rescue party as they sing a song to be used as a guide track for Tiomkin's scoring of the sequence. Capra wanted the approach to have a rhythm, so he had them sing the following. There was a farmer who had two sons, and these two sons were brothers. One was named Josephus, and Bohunkus was the other. This was repeated for the duration of the approach to the horror of Tibetan expert Harrison Foreman, who was informed that the recording would be used in the finished film. Not true, of course. A stickler for authenticity, Foreman was a perfect target for Buster Libet's tongue-in-cheek humor. Libet is seen here clowning for Keller's camera. Kappa readies the players for dialogue seen on the first landing. As we know it today, a long shot of this action fades to black in the film, followed by Levitt and Bernard's hallway meeting as servants beckon them to supper. What follows is a reconstruction of what originally appeared before the supper scene in the five-hour rough cut. Here, soundman Edward Burns leans on the Mole Richardson mic boom, affectionately named the Clam Digger, in preparation for the short, deleted welcome delivered by Chang. The group is told they will be shown to their rooms and offered a change of clothing. Later, they may join Chang for dinner. In a moment kept in the film, Conway trips and falls while gazing at Sandra. The group enters the lamasery, an action capper added to establish the reality of the building. The interior vestibule was a freestanding set on stage two. As the party enters, they hear music. A pair of servants motion to a set of sliding doors just out of frame, leading to a hallway in the party's quarters. Dissolve, and we are now on another stage two set. Sliding doors open and Chang stands before a mysterious someone we do not see to announce the plane has arrived with Conway and four others. The High Lama answers, excellent. Chang bows and exits. Dissolve and we're back with our existing story as Levitt and Bernard await dinner. Columbia President Harry Cohn's trims saved less than three minutes for the preview. Three days shooting on stage one captured both dining room scenes. This is one of several interconnected sets. Exposing massive amounts of film, Capra's two camera setup made its way around the table, catching the dialogue and reaction shots of the six principal actors. The fluid editing and evocative lighting suggested a rarefied atmosphere of warmth and informality. During a break in filming on stage one, Capra and Coleman intently discussed the looming war in Europe, a timely issue in both the novel and film. Still on stage one, 
George joins his brother on the patio. Doing a thing like that. That was on the other side of the hill. In the rough cut, they continued for a minute and a half as Bob told his brother not to discuss the kidnap theory with the others. This version concluded as the camera intercut between Sandra playing and Bob listening to her violin solo. John Howard's parents paid a visit to the ranch as the long shots for the scene were completed. Atop the pavilion, Chang draws our attention to the Valley of the Blue Moon, in reality, a location shot of California's Ojai Valley, as seen from an overlook off of Highway 150. A few of the remaining locations bear mentioning. Bob and Sandra's horseback ride began at Columbia Ranch. They galloped through ranch property on Mulholland Drive. The waterfall was Tockett's Falls, near Palm Springs. The lily pond, where Sandra swam, was Brent's Crags, now in Malibu State Park. Also shot there was stuntwoman Mary Wiggins' nude dive, doubling for Jane Wyatt. Sherwood Forest, now Westlake Village, is situated 40 miles from Hollywood. It served as location for Conway's walk through the Valley of the Blue Moon. Along the way, he observes sheep being herded across a Tibetan bridge, being sheared, pottery being made, and Sandra teaching the children to sing. The Pigeon House exterior was also built at Sherwood Forest. More lost footage involved 90 seconds of George and Maria's budding love affair. Conway's walk through the valley was also trimmed, as was the return from his walk with Sandra in the cherry orchard. Two scenes were completely restaged. In one, Bernard shared his gold discovery with Gloria. This was initially shot near the pergola, perched on the hillside overlooking the far end of the reflection pool. The final version of the scene was played closer to the pool and also shortened. Bob and Sandra's love scene, originally at the far end of the reflection pool, was moved to the grass under the arbor. The second version contained Conway's memorable silly shadow speech. But by far the biggest cuts involved Conway's scenes with the High Lama. This brings us to the largest myths associated with the making of the film. The reality, pieced meticulously from camera logs and script evolutions, has never been accurately told before. Capra had barely completed post-production on Mr. Deeds Goes to Town when principal photography began on Lost Horizon. The part of the High Lama was still not cast. Capra hated screen tests. Scripts were normally developed with actors for leading roles already in mind. Coleman was Conway from the beginning. For the part of the High Lama, however, Frank Capra and Robert Riskin disagreed. Riskin had envisioned Walter Connolly, a veteran of the previous four Capra features, as the High Lama. Capra felt Connolly was wrong for the role. He broke tradition and tested veteran character actor Fritz Lieber, but was unhappy with the results. Trade papers now reported that other actors were being interviewed. In two evenings of filming, at the ranch and a morning on stage two, Capra found himself directing the torchlit funeral procession of the High Lama he had yet to cast. Luella Parsons wrote a column that created a lasting myth concerning the casting of the High Lama's part. Two veteran actors and prior Coleman co-stars A.E. Anson and Henry B. Walthall had recently died. According to Parsons, A.E. Anson, pictured here in a scene from Aerosmith, had been brought to the studio in an ambulance, tested, awarded the role, and died two days later. Next, she continued, Walthall died before testing. The camera log details all of the screen tests. Anson was never tested. Parsons' puff piece was designed to make more dramatic the casting of Sam Jaffe in the part. Jaffe pursued the part through his agent at the suggestion of Howard Green, a friend and producer at RKO, who knew Capra was still looking for the right actor to play the role. During their interview, Capra looked into Jaffe's eyes and listened to his voice, and he knew the search was over. Back to actual filming on stage two. Bob subdues gun-toting George at the end of the second dinner scene. Capra and Warner discuss the entrance to the next scene. Chief Electrician George Hager checks a gimmick light as the actors rehearse. Chang joins Conway and the others. Chang blunts their questions by announcing the High Lama's request for a meeting with Conway. To heighten our anticipation, Bob and Chang's ascent to the High Lama's chamber was much longer and rough cut. On stage one, second assistant cameraman Bill Jolly marks the end of the first leg of the short walk from Conway's room to these sliding doors. On stage two, Conway and Chang will pass through what appears to be the same doorway seen here at the foot of the grand stairway. Chang tries to convey the great honor bestowed upon Conway. They mount the stairs to another hallway located on stage three, which leads to the foot of the spiral staircase. The spiral staircase was the only free standing interior set at the Columbia Ranch. Joe Walker lines up for an unusual, unused angle straight up through the center. As they wind their way up to the top, 
Conway says, look here, Chang, there better be a High Lama. Conway enters the anteroom. Back on stage two, the doors slide open as Conway enters the interior of the High Lama's chamber. Filming of the scenes began on July 10th and continued for six days. In Riskin's script, Conway's initial encounter with the High Lama was broken into two parts. In part one, the High Lama tells the story of Father Perot. As the tale concludes, Conway realizes Father Perot and the High Lama are one and the same person. Here, Riskin inserted a breath of comic relief. Lovett fusses, for all we know, he may be lying dead somewhere. In my opinion, it's only a question of who's next. Bernard replies, if you play your cards right, you may win the honors from all of us. We rejoin Conway and the High Lama, and the scene plays out much as we know it today. In Rough Cut, the first High Lama encounter ran four reels, approximately 40 minutes, and was shortened to two for preview, retaining the two-part construction. Author James Hilton argued for more cuts to the High Lama scenes, but Capra wanted to retain as much as possible. In fact, Jaffe added some bits of dialogue directly from the novel. Filming was slowed by many minor glitches. Best Boy Alator's grumbling stomach ruined a long take. Expensive talent was forced to hunt down noisy flies, and the usually letter-perfect Mr. Coleman blew his cue, explaining, I was mesmerized by Mr. Jaffe's fine performance. Jaffe was coached to speak louder. He was carefully positioned to hide the 500-watt projection lamp mounted on a stand behind his chair. This provided the beautiful effect we see in the film. Jaffe completed his work on July 16, 1936. Soundman Ed Burns was startled when film editor Gene Havlick, a notorious pessimist, declared this picture will be the biggest thing ever. Now Columbia boss Harry Cohn stepped in. He'd seen Jaffe's performance and thought it weird and the makeup unrealistic. He instructed Capra to return and film Walter Connolly in the part. Cohn ordered an expensive new set to be constructed on stage nine to further showcase Connolly. MGM's Jack Don was borrowed to create the new makeup you see here. Capra was outwardly supportive, but inwardly unwavering in his support of Jaffe. He filmed Connolly, essentially retaining the structure of the script Jaffe had used, but modifying the persona of the High Lama to be hearty, healthy, and cheerful, instead of feeble and spiritual. Joseph Ruttenberg performed the filming chores since Joe Walker had moved on to his next assignment. Both the Jaffe and Connolly versions were tested in preview, and audience response forced Cohn to agree that Jaffe had been the correct choice all along. In a war of wills with Cohn, and out of respect for the talents of his favorite cinematographer, Capra waited a full month until Joseph Walker was again available. Jaffe was recalled in December. His makeup slightly modified for more realism, and the script changed to shorten the High Lama's role. This was accomplished by creating a new scene, in which Chang is the one to tell Conway the story of Father Perot. The opportunity won H.P. Warner a Best Supporting Actor nomination. The writing and camera setups and the refilmed Jaffe performance were kept identical to the first shooting so that Coleman's reaction shots could be reused. The opening long dolly shot is all that remains today of Jaffe's first try at the role. Note the absence of a crutch, which serves as a visual cue for Conway to identify Perot as the High Lama in the shortened version that exists today. Even though Capra had won the casting battle, it was a bittersweet victory, for in the end, Cohn insisted on a shorter, final release version, and Capra lost six reels of his masterpiece. Once seen, the haunting sounds and images of Lost Horizon are never forgotten. Just as I'm sure there's a wish for Shangri-La in everyone's heart. It's magic. Welcome to Shangri-La. I am placing in your hands the future and destiny of Shangri-La. This has been Kendall Miller.